Welcome to Commentaries in Hair Loss. I'm Dr. Jeff Donovan. I hope you'll join me as we explore some important questions from the field of hair loss. Our focus today will be on the scalp biopsy and we'll take a look at what the scalp biopsy can show and we'll look at some comparisons between patients with androgenetic alopecia, alopecia areata, and scarring alopecia. So let's begin then. Let's get out some paper and we can make some comparisons between these conditions. Let me just draw a border around this paper so I can get a clear sense of what will be captured by this video and what will be outside of this video. I think that works well. And we're going to draw this into four quadrants because we're going to take a look at comparisons between the normal scalp, androgenetic alopecia or AGA, alopecia areata, or AA, and finally scarring alopecia, also known as cicatricial alopecia, and we'll use the prototypical conditions like in plano pilaris and frontal fibrosing alopecia, LPP, FFA, as our example. So let's begin then. Let's draw the skin, and this is a schematic diagram of the skin with its three layers, the fat layer at the bottom, the dermis in the middle, and the epidermis at the top. And we'll use this model in all four examples. So let's draw some skin again. Again with our epidermis, dermis, and fat layer. And for our alopecia areata model, the epidermis, dermis, and fat layer. And finally, as we talk about scarring alopecia, we'll use this one here. Okay, so let's begin then. Let's talk about the normal skin. We have hair follicles, which I'll draw in black here, which find their way deep into the fat layer. They come in bundles of one or two or three hairs that root themselves down. Some are in catagen and telogen phase and are higher up. That's very normal. We have some oil glands present in the normal scalp. I'll draw that in yellow and these are quite abundant and a sign of non-scarring alopecia, which we'll talk about. I'll use this blue marker today to denote some inflammation. There's maybe a few inflammatory cells present in the normal scalp, and this is of no real significance. So what about an androgenetic alopecia? Well, we have some hairs rooted down in the fat as well, and uh, there are less of these bundles of one and uh, two and three hairs. There are more one hair bundles. And as the disease progresses, the uh, finding of miniaturization is found. And what I'll draw here is some thinner hairs. Uh, these are miniaturized and vellus hairs. And I'll also draw some tracks where hairs once lived. And the key feature of androgenetic alopecia is this miniaturization process whereby thick hairs become thinner hairs. So here's a terminal hair, which I've drawn here. These are thick hairs, 80 microns in size. And during the course of genetic hair loss, they're converted into these tiny skinny vellus hairs, which are 20 and 30 micrometers in size. Along the way, the miniaturized hairs are found. These are hairs that are intermediate between the terminal and vellus hairs. They're thinner, but they do reach down into the lower levels of the dermis. And in androgenetic alopecia, we have abundant oil glands, and so I've drawn those here in yellow. These are the oil glands, sebaceous glands. And again, sebaceous glands are a feature of non-scarring alopecia. Sometimes in androgenetic alopecia, we find inflammation, and we find it in the upper region of the hair follicle uh, in this so-called isthmus. 
And in androgenetic alopecia, sometimes we also find scarring, little bits of loose perifollicular fibrosis. And this is a surprise to many people, and this is often a source of misdiagnosis, but there often is a little bit of perifollicular fibrosis present in androgenetic alopecia, and there's some inflammation as well. This is where sometimes the biopsies are interpreted incorrectly for, for a scarring alopecia, when in fact it's just genetic hair loss. So inflammation and scarring are present in genetic hair loss. So let's talk about alopecia areata now. In alopecia areata, we have hairs that are rooted down in the fat, of course, some of them, and I'll denote that again with black. Uh, in alopecia areata, the hairs are missing in many areas, and so I'll draw some tracks in here where the hairs once lived, but they have been told to exit on account of the inflammation. And sometimes in alopecia areata, we also see some miniaturized hairs, different than the miniaturized hair in genetic hair loss. These are hairs that are um, shorter and smaller and thinner. They're generally all of the same uh, degree of thinness, same uh, uh, size miniaturized hairs. And I'll denote this here with these three miniaturized hairs. These are very typical of what we see in alopecia areata. Uh, but in a different than androgenetic alopecia, where they're the same size, you'll note in the diagram before they were different sizes. And these are the tracks where the hair once lived. And so the, the pathologist can see these tracks where the hair has fallen out of. But the key feature of alopecia areata is this inflammation that I'm drawing here. This is inflammation that's found around the bulbs and in, in the fat layer, but also in the tracks as well. And uh, in alopecia areata, these are T cells. These are lymphocytes, which are around the bulb. This is the so-called swarm of bees of inflammation that we see around the bulb. And we also see other cells besides lymphocytes. We see eosinophils, and I'll use this light blue marker to draw these eosinophils here. Uh, the finding of eosinophils in the tracts is very typical of alopecia areata, and it can in fact help us with some tough diagnoses. But the inflammation we see is lymphocytes, which I'll draw with an L, and eosinophils with an E. This uh, is the type of inflammation we see in alopecia areata. And finally, let's talk about uh, the oil glands. And I'll use this yellow again to denote the presence of these sebaceous glands in alopecia areata. Again, this is a non-scarring alopecia, so we see the sebaceous glands. What about scarring alopecia? Well, we see terminal hairs uh, if, if it's not too far advanced, and uh, we may see a couple of terminal hairs in a biopsy, but we don't see these bundles of two and three that we saw in the first diagram of normal scalp. These are destroyed by the inflammatory process. Uh, we may see remnants of where the hair once lived, and so you may see uh, various parts of the hair fiber um, sitting out in the skin all by itself with inflammation around it, and we may see some sick-appearing uh, hairs which are, which are shorter and twisted, and these can be visible on the surface of the scalp. And um, I'll use the blue marker here to denote inflammation. In, in scarring alopecia, we often see inflammation in the upper part of the hair follicle in the so-called isthmus. And um, these are lymphocytes uh, often in, in the case of lichen plano pilaris, sometimes plasma cells. But this is, this is inflammation, which is part of the autoimmune response in many of these scarring alopecias and we see fibrosis. I'll use the red marker again to denote this scar tissue that's present. It may be a little bit of scar tissue, it may be quite a lot of scar tissue, but this is the perifollicular fibrosis that's so typical of these scarring alopecias, and this is what's destroying the ability of the hair to regrow. This also makes it difficult to transplant into if it's too thick. Uh, once the disease becomes quiet. And so this is the perifollicular fibrosis, the scar tissue that's such a hallmark of these advanced scarring alopecias. And I'll use this to denote the oil glands, the sebaceous glands. There's not many sebaceous glands in scarring alopecias. They're lost, they're reduced, and that's why we don't see them. I'll draw a few yellow dots, but uh, they're mostly absent in these advanced scarring alopecias. 
And the other thing I'd like to comment on is the pattern of inflammation. These blue dots are around the isthmus, but uh, they're also around the hair follicle outer root sheath in a so-called lichenoid pattern. The, the keratinocytes of the outer root sheath are destroyed. They're dying in these scarring alopecias, and that's called lichenoid inflammation. So finally, let me take this green marker and comment on the stem cells. Uh, stem cells are present in many areas of the hair follicle, but especially in this uh, upper part of the isthmus where the oil glands can be found. This is where we find a lot of stem cells. Stem cells are cells that give rise to new hair follicles, and you can see them in androgenetic alopecia as well, and you can see them in alopecia areata as well. And this is important because if we can get rid of the inflammation, we can regrow hairs in alopecia areata. But in scarring alopecia, we don't see many of these stem cells because the inflammatory process destroys these stem cells and destroys or severely limits the ability of the uh, skin and, and, and hair to make a new hair. So stem cells are reduced in scarring alopecia and that's one of the reasons it has less regenerative ability. So that provides you with an overview of, of the histopathology of these four uh, conditions and I hope this has been helpful for you and uh, I look forward to speaking to you again about various aspects in hair loss.